In beginning this journey through Kingdom Hearts, I've come to learn that some of the worlds we explore have a lot of hidden details to them, and genuine beauty that I've personally overlooked in so many of my playthroughs of the game. In all honesty, Traverse Town is one world that felt so boring to me in my initial playthroughs growing up, but after taking the time to learn more about the world for this video and finding the hidden mythology behind it, it's really shown me just how important this world really is, and just how deep the connections really go. So without further ado, let's dive into the wonderful world of Traverse Town. Acting as the pseudo-hub world for Kingdom Hearts, Traverse Town is our first world outside of the tutorial, and it's split up into three primary districts. The first acts as our home for restocking supplies and upgrading our gear. The second district provides a more open area to explore with small nooks, crannies, and houses spread throughout it. And the third district acts as an arena of sorts to battle against the Heartless while taking in the sights. Traverse Town is meant to be the true introduction into the series, and its many concepts. On top of this, the world plays host to many of the Final Fantasy characters we'll periodically interact with for the rest of the game. Characters like Yuffie, Aerith, Sid, and Squall. That's Leon. I mean, Leon. I should mention as well that it's here that we get to meet our two new friends, and the first of many Disney characters, Donald the Mage and Goofy the Soldier, both of whom know just about as much of what's going on as we do, but I'm getting ahead of myself here. Seeing as this is the pseudo-hub world for the entire game, there are going to be plenty of times where we are forced to come back to Traverse Town to progress the story. So. In this video, we'll be going in order of the progression of the game. Oh, and something I almost forgot to mention, seeing as we are just exploring the first game in the series, I unfortunately won't be touching on the additions Dream Drop Distance makes to Traverse Town, as many of the elements of the world remain relatively the same in both. Now with that out of the way, let's continue our journey with Sora in exploring the connections of Traverse Town to mythology. Our journey through Traverse Town begins by showing us a star going out, as pointed out by Donald and Goofy. This star is presumably Destiny Islands, as we then find Sora in and out of consciousness in the alleyway. Upon waking up, Sora is able to explore the area and speak to the few denizens that live here, whom we'll be meeting more of in time with further visits. Entering the shop, we get to meet Sid Highwind from Final Fantasy VII, who isn't as foul-mouthed in this rendition as he is in his original game. But after exploring what we can within the first district, we soon head into the second district to explore some more of the town. This is our first encounter with an emblemed Heartless, and is our first look into just what exactly these things are. Now, I promise we'll be looking into the mythology, but as these are our primary enemies throughout the series, I think it'd be best to first understand them a bit better. If you've played through the series, you've more than likely noticed that the Heartless come in a wide variety, with some big, some small, and many others in between. But something that really sets the Heartless apart from one another is the emblem that is plastered on many of the Heartless. An extended heart that is crossed out is something that plays to the theme of the Heartless not having a heart for themselves, but instead actively seeking one out. In contrast, some Heartless don't have these emblems on them, and actually sport relatively simple designs and comparisons with creatures like the Shadows and Darkseid, as we've seen on Destiny Islands. These Heartless, the ones without the emblems, are more Shadow than anything else, and are designated as Pure Blood Heartless, beings that exist as the antithesis of light, pure darkness personified within a heart, wanting desperately to consume new hearts to fortify their masses. 
Though both Pure Blood and Emblemed Heartless play the same role as our enemies, the Emblemed Heartless were formed through artificial means, through experiments conducted on hearts. And through the Ansem reports that we acquired throughout our journey, we discovered that the origins of these creatures weren't through nefarious means, but instead through scientific hubris. Now, we won't actually get any of these reports until we complete Agrabah later on down the line, but these are extremely important to the overall story of Kingdom Hearts. One report reads, The shadows that crawl beneath the castle. Are they the people who lost their hearts? Or incarnations of darkness? Or something entirely beyond my imagination? All my knowledge has provided no answer. One thing I am sure of is that they are entirely devoid of emotion. Perhaps further study will unlock the mysteries of the heart. Fortunately, there is no shortage of test samples. They are multiplying underground even as I write this report. They still need a name. Those who lack hearts. I will call them the Heartless. Through these reports, we find that it was Ansem who first discovered the pureblood Heartless and subsequently created the emblemed Heartless through his experimentations on hearts. Though a breakthrough discovery for Ansem, it would bring more darkness to his world and many others. Now, I won't be covering every Heartless in Kingdom Hearts here, as there are a lot of different types, but I will be covering them in a different video later on down the line. I think one of the more obvious observations we can make of the Heartless is this first scene of a person's heart being consumed by a Heartless, reflecting the belief of the heart in Egyptian myth. It's thought that the people of Egypt believed that the heart was the center of the body and mind, being that all blood was sent through and from the heart, it meant that this was the core of what made a person a person. In this, the heart was seen as the most sacred part of a person, and losing it would be akin to not only losing their life, but their very essence. In the ritualistic burials, the heart was the one organ that would remain within the body, as all the other organs would be removed and blessed within their respective canopic jars. Once a person had made it to the afterlife, it would be their heart that would weigh the judgment of a person's life, as the heart was weighed against the feather of Ma'at to see whether the person had lived a good and just life. If they hadn't, then the heart would be devoured by the monster Amit, effectively erasing the person from existence. This thought behind the heart being the core to what a person is is not far off from what the Kingdom Hearts series sees as when a person's heart is consumed by the darkness, or in this poor soul's case, a heartless, they are effectively erased from existence. Now, in further games, we learn that there is more to this, but we'll get more into that when we eventually cover them. Another point I want to make is what exactly happens with the heart when a person's heart is lost to the heartless. As mentioned before, when a person's heart is taken by the heartless or by the darkness, a new heartless is formed from that person's heart. The stronger the heart, the stronger the heartless, in a sense. This idea relates to the idea behind the doppelganger, a formation of a person that is a near copy of the original person. Originally being a German term for double walker, the doppelganger is an idea that connects to a lot of different cultures and beliefs. In France, for instance, during the 1700s, a like term, fetch, was used to represent a paranormal or supernatural form that was created from a living person. The Egyptians would believe in a doppelganger through the Ka, or a person's spirit double. Seen more so as the soul of a person, it was perceived as the more tangible essence of a person that could communicate or interact with the living world. Finally, it's through the English that the current idea of a doppelganger is formed as the evil twin of a person. 
an apparition of darkness that is seen as a dark omen or a harbinger of evil. This relates back to how a person's heart is converted by the darkness or by a heartless to increase their masses, creating doppelgangers or dark doubles of everyday people. Now, the final point I want to talk about with the heartless are the connections to the belief of shadow people within the many cultures around the world, as it's really through this belief that many of the heartless take their inspiration. Though not pinned down to any specific region or cult of worship, the concept of shadow people is actually right in the name, a shape or form of a human that is either cloaked in shadow or is in itself a shadow or darkness. Being that both the pure blood and the artificial heartless are born through the darkness of people's hearts, it's fairly safe to connect these two to the concept of a humanoid shape within the darkness that so many have seen. For many around the world, shadow people exist as dark manifestations of evil, or as a sign of bad omens. Some believe as well that those who have died through harmful ways can become shadow people themselves to haunt those that have killed them or become vengeful spirits that are unable to pass on, continuing to haunt those surrounding their death. This is akin to how when a heartless devours a person's heart, essentially killing them, the heart is then filled with darkness and becomes a new heartless itself increasing the number of the creatures to spread the darkness. This is especially apparent for the shadow and dark side heartless that we've seen previously as they exist as pure shadow, with the most basic form taking on an invulnerable state by becoming a shadow on the ground. Now, after fending off the heartless, we're able to explore much of what the second district has around it. Shops, a hotel, and a clock tower dotting the landscape and actually providing a cheeky interaction with Donald and Goofy if we enter and exit different locations. Unfortunately, there's not much else to do here, so it's actually best to head back to the first district. However, the Heartless are now appearing here, near endlessly, and we'll need to take cover in Sid's shop for the time being. But after speaking with Sid and heading back out, a new, yet familiar character speaks to us about the Keyblade and how the Heartless will continue to seek us out while we wield it. They'll come at you out of nowhere. Who are you? And they'll keep on coming at you, as long as you continue to wield the Keyblade. But why? Why would it choose a kid like you? Hey, what's that supposed to mean? Never mind. Now, let's see that Keyblade. What? There's no way you're getting this. All right, then have it your way. This is Squall. That's Leon. Sorry, this is Leon, another of the Final Fantasy characters living here in Traverse Town alongside Sid. Leon is a peculiar character as he comes off brash and headstrong, but in reality, he's our saving grace for this area. Leon acts as a mini-boss for this area, and we're actually meant to lose against him. But if we learn his moveset, we can actually beat him without much trouble. Now, looking further into Leon, and especially his design, I want to speak on what he is wearing here, as it not only plays to his role throughout the game, but helps us understand the mythology that establishes his character. Being the main protagonist of Final Fantasy VIII, Squall Leonhardt is a leader by nature, and is one that can seem fairly unassuming at first, but can easily overpower any foe he comes across. Squall, I mean Leon, has two symbols that coincide with mythology and his personality. The first thing that we see is the angel wings on his back. Shown prominently in his entrance, angelic wings are meant to show a heavenly presence, as is apparent in the Abrahamic belief, as an angel's wings show the connection to God's purifying light and even the angel's ranking, with beings like the cherubim 
having multiple sets of wings, while according to the Book of Enoch, archangels like Gabriel, Michael, and Raphael are said to have a single set of wings. It's these angels that act as protectors and guides towards one's salvation and faith. Now, this isn't far off from the idea of a guardian angel as well, as being a divine being guiding and helping a person in their life. Relating back to Leon's role with Sora, he acts as a sort of guardian angel and protector to the new Keyblade wielder. Another point I want to make with Leon and his design is that of his other symbol that is deeply rooted to his character, the pendant that he wears and the symbol of the Griever. Now, if you don't know what a Griever is or have never even heard of it, you're not alone in this as this creature was specifically made for Final Fantasy VIII, but it does have some inspiration from myth. A Griever is a lion-headed monster with angelic wings that is meant to represent a powerful being that is both prideful and just. Its name derives from to grieve or to feel sorrow for, sharing with us the idea that even with a being so powerful and just, it still shows compassion and sadness for things that it has lost. The idea behind a lion-headed monster with angelic wings is a chimera of different ideals and thoughts. For one, the lion is seen as the leader of the group, meant to be a king of sorts, a protective and powerful creature. As for the wings, it's meant to share a lightness to it, that even though it is a very powerful protector, the wings will provide some softness and even some swiftness when it comes to protecting those closest to it. A similar creature would be that of the griffin, the eagle-headed, lion-bodied, winged beast of central Eurasian belief that represented the most powerful and majestic of the kings of the sky and the earth. I'd also like to add that the crest designed for Leon's griever is similar to the cross of St. James, a heraldic badge of faith in Christ as well as a symbol of martyrdom, as St. James was beheaded by the sword for his faith. You know, since we're on the topic of Leon and the Final Fantasy characters, I think it'd be fitting to talk a bit about our next two Final Fantasy companions that we meet in our journey. Whether or not we beat Leon in our fight, we'll be brought back to the hotel in the second district and learn more about the Heartless and the Keyblade through Yuffie and Aerith central characters from Final Fantasy VII. These two, alongside Leon, represent another trinity that Kingdom Hearts loves to express through the series. The three, Leon, Aerith, and Yuffie, all represent different elements of the Earth. With Leon, or Squall, his name means the gusts of wind that go across the Earth. For Yuffie, her name means well-spoken, and relate to the whispers or words that are carried by the divine wind. While Aerith means the earth or flowers, as she represents the caring and healing nature of the earth. With this, I find it fascinating to learn that all three of these characters' names derive from Greek myths and even some Greek names. In some sources, Leon shares the same name with a giant of Greek myth, who would fight against Heracles during the Gigantomachy. In some other sources, they dictate that this Leon was the Nemean lion that Heracles would kill and skin during his labors. For Aerith, her name derives from a close anagram for Earth. Being that she is so closely connected to the planet, she was seen as a representative of it, as the planet of Final Fantasy VII was named Gaia, or Mother Earth in Greek myth. To add to this, Aerith's original name in the PS1 title was meant to be Eris, with her caring and loving nature playing opposite to the Greek goddess of strife and discord, Eris. Series creator Tetsuya Nomura really loves to play with opposites, as Aerith is so closely connected to, and is the exact opposite, of Cloud 
strife. Finally, for Yuffie, her name is derived from the Greek goddess of praise and triumphant shouts, Euphemy. This is furthered as she clearly announces all her attacks during her fights, as well as being a very outspoken character, who consistently provides praise to not only herself, but to others as well. One other thing I'd like to quickly point out, a little off topic, but is the fact that these three represent a different portion of the psychoanalytical theory, with Yuffie representing the id or impulsive nature of a person, Leon representing the ego or the more realistic approach to life, and Aerith representing the superego or the morality of a person to uphold the values of life and society. Oh, and before I forget, in relation to the names and trinities, I want to give a quick shout out and thank you to creator 2C Phoenix, who pointed out over Discord that the names Sora, Kairi, and Riku, our three main characters, all have connected meanings in Japanese, with Sora's name meaning sky, Kairi's name meaning sea, and Riku's name meaning the land, all of which instantly make me think of the three beastly kings of the Hebrew Bible, Behemoth, the king of the land, Leviathan, the king of the sea, and Ziz, the king of the sky, each of which were meant to maintain the order of the creatures under Yahweh's rule. So thank you so much again for that to see Phoenix and be sure to check out his channel as he's currently covering every detail in the Kingdom Hearts series. But after speaking with Leon, our hideout is invaded by the Heartless and we're forced into the streets to find the boss of the area. Making our way to the third district, we come across our two new best friends, Donald the Mage and Goofy the Soldier. And with their help, we're able to battle against the Guard Armor, the leader of the Heartless in Traverse Town, which, oddly enough, is a lot like the D&D monster animated armor, with having the floating helmets, gauntlets, and so on. Now, Guard Armor is a bit of a pushover on lower difficulties, but if you are playing on Proud Mode, just take your time with the attacks and timing his attacks with yours. Either way, you'll come out just fine. Defeating the guard armor brings the three new friends together, leading Goofy to announce a familiar phrase. All for one, one for all. This phrase has been made popular through its use in the now famous 1844 novel by Alexandre Dumas, The Three Musketeers, meaning everything for the group and the group working together for everyone's benefit. The phrase originated in Latin as unus pro omnibus omnes pro uno, and is quoted as originating in William Shakespeare's 1594 poem, The Rape of Lucrece. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Not exactly mythology, but a fun fact nonetheless. Finishing out our adventure through our first visit, Sora is now able to use the fire magic spell, and the gang can now jump at blue trinity marks they see on the ground. Again, this trinity is an extremely common theme throughout the Kingdom Hearts series as we've just explored here and even with the Destiny Islands. So I'll try not to sound like a broken record every time it comes up. But here we see the mark is made up of three interconnected hearts just to show how Sora, Donald, and Goofy's hearts are all connected to one another working in tandem. Town has so much to offer us in its thematic storytelling, its design, and in its hidden influences. But that isn't to say that this is all that this world has to offer. We'll still need to visit Traverse Town three more times before the end of our journey, and we're only just getting started. If you'd like to show your support, consider subscribing to the channel or by joining the League of Historians by becoming a patron. Links are all in the description. Thank you again. And as always, I'll see you all next time.